Another piece of breaking news here on the show in regards to the latest NFL headlines here, and we'll start things off with a Wall Street Journal exclusive that came out moments before the show, how the President of the United States, the leader of the free world, the 45th man in charge of this country, influenced the NFL's policy in regards to the NFL's national anthem. Okay, so here's the deal. Now, there's a lot to this Wall Street Journal article, by the way, and if you go out and read it, it's documented in not really chronological order, which is how I should feel it should be, or in an inverted pyramid type of way, but here is essentially how it goes. So this is all coming from the documents from the depositions of Colin Kaepernick's grievance case against the National Football League. As we know, Jerry Jones was recently deposed in the Colin Kaepernick grievance case against the NFL, alleging that, of course, all 32 NFL owners colluded against Kaepernick to keep him out of the league. So according to the journal, President Trump said the following in a phone call with Jerry Jones, quote, this is a very winning, strong issue for me, saying that he wants Jerry Jones to stick with this, to fight for this, to be the cause and the reason for the NFL implementing a new policy in regards to the national anthem. A White House official said Trump was essentially advising Jones on what he believed would be good for the country and good for the sport. So throughout these depositions, including owner of the Texans, Bob McNair, as well as owner of the Dolphins, Stephen Ross, there you see Jerry on your list there as an example of some of the folks who have been deposed throughout this case. Trump shifted the conversation through his public statements and Twitter rants. So I do want to go back to what he said last September in a stump speech in Alabama where he essentially said that if a hypothetical player knelt during the national anthem, his team's owner should, quote, get that son of a bee off the field and now, fill in the blanks. On Twitter, he later encouraged owners to fire those players and suggested a boycott. And boom, full stop, here's why this story is important. Suggested a boycott. We are talking about the President of the United States, the one single individual who probably has the most influence in terms of PR, in terms of businesses, et cetera, in this entire country, perhaps even the world. So behind the scenes, the likes of Stephen Ross and Jerry Jones and Bob McNair are scrambling here because they're worried they will lose sponsors, they will lose money, they will lose revenue due to bad PR coming from the president, all right? So let's also note that the owners didn't necessarily agree with how President Trump was going about this national anthem debate. They didn't like how he used the B word. They didn't like how his language on Twitter really wasn't reflective of the country, at least according to some of these documents here. But that didn't matter because the main motiv motivation here is that Bob McNair and Stephen Ross and Jerry Jones and all these owners were scared of losing sponsors, of boycotts, of losing fans, of seeing empty seats in the stands. And it didn't matter how they thought the president went about this matter. What really was the important point here was that the president was actually talking about it. Donald Trump was taking to Twitter, was going on stump speeches in Alabama and the like, to talk about this matter. And that's all the NFL owners needed to hear, needed to know. It didn't matter how the president went about it. Because the owners then saw potential boycotts, potential problems with sponsors. So Robert Kraft, another example, reportedly didn't like how Trump handled the situation. But at the end of the day, these owners felt like they had no choice but to go along with what the president wanted. And the president wanted a policy where players were required to stand for the national anthem. So what happened last week? Owners meetings in Atlanta? Look at that. Players are now required to stand during the national anthem. And if they don't, teams will be fined. And teams could also punish 
their respective players however they see fit, although players do have the option to stay in the locker room. So it's like dot after dot after dot, domino after domino after domino, if you will, all these connections are starting to fall in line. So full stop. Here is the story. Colin Kaepernick has a grievance case against the NFL. He is a alleging that all 32 NFL owners are colluding against him to keep him out of the league, okay? Colin Kaepernick deposed some of these guys and plenty of others in sworn testimony, not in a court setting, but essentially sworn questioning, where if you lie, you could be in some serious trouble. And the statements made in these depositions were leaked to the Wall Street Journal, perhaps from the Kaepernick camp, perhaps from somebody else, who knows, essentially saying that owners did not like how the president was going about his messaging with the national anthem policy, but they also felt like they had to fall in line with what Donald Trump wanted. And that was a requirement to stand during the national anthem, and the owners were scared because they were afraid of perhaps losing sponsorships, seeing a boycott happen. And so the owners did what they had to do. They felt cornered. The leader of the free world made his stance known. And Jerry Jones, Bob McNair, Robert Kraft, Stephen Ross, all these owners said, we got to implement something. We have to etch something into legislation. The owners' meetings happened last week. There you go, folks. It's now a requirement to stand during the national anthem. So it goes from the president, it goes to Jerry Jones and his depositions, it goes to Stephen Ross, it goes to Bob McNair, it goes to these owner meetings last week, and it's just domino after domino after domino, and here's where we are. Totally new policy, more division perhaps, that's up for debate, and one of the main storylines going into this NFL regular season Who's going to stay in the locker room? Who's going to stand during the National Anthem? Who's going to go onto the field and kneel during the National Anthem? And that's one of the big time stories that we are continuing to follow here. So there you go. The president at the middle of all of this. All right, let's continue on with some more headlines here. Des Bryant hinting at joining the San Francisco 49ers said in an Instagram comment that he wants to play for San Francisco. That was in a response to someone asking him what team he wants to play for. He did later delete the comment. So there's that, but of course, it's the internet. It's 2018. We can save. We can screenshot. There you go. And if Dez were to go to the 49ers, he'd be joining the likes of Pierre Garçon and Marquise Goodwin and Trent Taylor. And I used to have the 49ers on my top five landing spots for Dez Bryant for a couple of reasons, because I thought San Francisco was pretty aggressive so far in the free agency period. Maybe they would have went out and looked into Des Bryant. They also had the salary cap space. But as you see here, they're no longer on my list. And I'm not going to put them there just because Des Bryant wants to be in San Francisco because we also heard that Des Bryant wants to be with the New York Giants. And as you see on your screen there, I don't have the Giants on my list either. I still am holding firm that New England and Indianapolis and Seattle make the most sense in my eyes from a need standpoint from a salary cap standpoint, as well as from what we've seen in the past, a historical standpoint, more specifically with the New England Patriots, because New England has brought in some old veterans before and kind of revamped their careers a little bit. That said, Brandon Marshall is now employed. We'll talk about him later. My question is, so why is Des Bryant still out there? Is there something we don't know? Because Brandon Marshall is coming off an injury-riddled campaign in 2017. Des Bryant is not. So why is Dez still on the open market? He did reject an offer from the Baltimore Ravens at a multi-year deal at that. Is he wide receiver number one? Of course not. Not at the stage of his career right now. But can he help a team? I firmly believe so. I think he can help the likes of Seattle in New England and Indianapolis. And I still have Seattle there because, well, they still have needs at wide receiver despite signing Brandon Marshall. So there you go, Des Bryant hinting at joining the 49ers. I will tell you right here, right now, that I don't feel Des would mesh very well with San Francisco. I don't think San Fran will look into signing Des. Like I mentioned, they have Goodwin, Garcon, and Taylor. Dante Pettis, their rookie there as well. So it doesn't make the most sense in the world. But Des 
made his preference known most recently on Instagram. All right, let's get to the next storyline here. This coming out of the holiday weekend. According to a report, players may actually sit out the entire season until Colin Kaepernick is signed. So players are currently considering this act, and this also alludes to Eric Reed as well until he is signed. Both those players have their grievance cases against the NFL, colluding or alleging that the NFL is colluding against them. Apparently some players are hoping to get 25% of their fellow teammates and players to participate in this sit-out, if you will. And this, of course, comes after the new NFL National Anthem policy was created by the NFL owners, essentially saying that the players have to stand during the anthem if they are on the field or they have the option of staying in the locker room. I don't know how much credence this report really has, this coming from Sean King. And uh, I'm sure players are considering it. Whether or not they will act on it is the major question mark here. You got to think about the fact that players want to play football and they want to make money. I know they also want to make a statement, and I know a lot of them are in the back corner there standing in unison with Colin Kaepernick, but to the extent of sitting out an entire season seems to be a little far-fetched. I don't know if that actually will go down, but it is a story, and we are going to report upon it here on the Cam Rogers Show. Kaepernick, Eric Reed. Now enter the month of June, still unsigned. If you were an NFL player, would you sit out until Colin Kaepernick was signed? Let me know in the comments section here on Facebook Live as well as YouTube. I want to hear from you guys. Let me know what you think about Colin Kaepernick and this ongoing story with him, Eric Reed, the National Anthem, anything of the sort, the president as well. Let me know what you guys think. All right, let's talk about a wide receiver for the Atlanta Falcons and Julio Jones. Sounds like he's in a good place with Atlanta, saying there's no bad blood between me or the team. Quote, everybody on the outside trying to look in and trying to destroy what we built there. I'm not going nowhere. I'll be there. I love the team. I love the organization. I love everybody there. I'm good. That's what Julio Jones recently said. And he also said he isn't upset about his new contract and hoping to eventually get some sort of extension here he doesn't want people to think he's upset with the organization and i understand that a lot of players are sitting out or sat out for voluntary otas because they are voluntary if you're an nfl player and you're a star player perhaps the best at your respective position why go to OTAs when they're voluntary and you can just work out on your own in Alabama, which is exactly what Julio Jones is doing. And oh, by the way, you can prevent injury, kind of like with what happened with Hunter Henry, tight end of the Los Angeles Chargers there, who is out essentially for the year because of a torn ACL. So I understand where Julio Jones is coming from. I agree. I don't think there's a lot of there there with this story. I think he will be back for mandatory mini camp. Uh, head coach Dan Quinn has been vocal in saying that that will happen as well. So nothing too much to worry about here, Atlanta Falcons fans. But I will say this, in regards to voluntary OTAs, like if you were a student and you were in high school, for example, and a school day was voluntary, would you go? Obviously not. Especially if you're a star student, you're like a 4.0 student, like you can skip one day. Julio Jones is a 4.0 student in that regard. So there you go. Let's go to another star wide receiver here. OBJ almost fully cleared to play, according to new head coach Pat Shermer, saying, quote, he was pretty close. So OBJ has been present at voluntary OTAs, and he will continue to go throughout the practices and the offseason workouts and all that such, despite being at the center of some trade rumors as well as some displeasure, if you will, with the Giants' leadership in regards to his contract and how OBJ wants a contract extension and so on. But he's been there almost ready to be fully cleared to play as well. He's been in and out of offseason training, and Pat Shermer also said that Beckham is chomping at the bit to fully return to practice. So that's certainly good news if OBJ is excited to get back on the football field at full speed at 100% and to be with the New York Giants. Certainly sounds like OBJ ain't going anywhere 
and he probably will just have to play his final year of his contract and then have to go through negotiations next offseason with the New York Giants. But there you go, Odell Beckham Jr., close to being cleared there. Good news for the New York Giants out there. Some not-so-good news for the New England Patriots, at least from a PR standpoint. Former Patriot Cassius Marsh reportedly, or actually not really reportedly, he said it. He didn't have a lot of fun with the New England Patriots when he was on the team. So saying, quote, they don't have any fun there. There's nothing fun about it. This going to the San Francisco Chronicle. Marsh, now a member of the 49ers. The Niners picked him up off waivers last season. Marsh said Belichick didn't let him play at his strengths, saying he covered receivers and running backs instead of rushing the passer like he was used to at Seattle. Also confronted Belichick, but didn't see any change happen. <clears throat> so, quote, I just wasn't a fan, and so I... Basically, without asking to get cut, I kind of asked to get cut. So a little wordplay there from Cassius Marsh, like, hey, I don't want to be here. Can you, like, cut me? Like, that'd be great. Release me, let me go, kind of deal. So eventually was claimed off waivers, like I said, by the 49ers. After playing nine games with the New England Patriots, it's a two-year, $7.7 .7 million contract extension back in February. So... Obviously, an important part to the 49ers and their ability to create sacks and get after the passer and all that. He will be used the right way in San Francisco. That I can tell you. But here is the broad stroke of the issue. And this is just a subplot to the main plot here with the New England Patriots, specifically Bill Belichick. And I want to thank Cassius Marsh for feeding into my theory that the Patriots organization is taking the fun out of football, particularly Bill Belichick. Gronk and Brady certainly wanted to send messages in regards to that when Gronk took forever to commit to playing for this year, and Brady is busy skipping OTAs in favor of the Formula One Grand Prix and trips to the United Kingdom. All right, so Cassius Marsh is just another example of the discord, perhaps, within the Patriots organization, and to that, I am just going to sip on my water and say, well, but that's none of my business, right? Remember that meme? <sighs> yeah. Thank you for feeding into my theory, Cassius Marsh. So you have to wonder if this is the tip of the iceberg, right? Will there be more former Patriots talking about this situation and talking about this franchise and how it is currently run. I have talked about the end of the Brady Belichick dynasty before. Not necessarily that it's happening right now, but we are getting closer and closer and closer. It's drip after drip after drip. And I don't care if you're a wizard of a head coach. I don't care if you're Bill Belichick or Lombardi or anybody. If your players do not buy in, to what you are preaching, you will not be successful. And Mike Florio of Pro Football Talk recently wrote an article saying that maybe Brady has just had it with the Bill Belichick reign, if you will. Sometimes situations just get stale. Be sure to let me know in the reaction poll. It is at the end of the Brady Belichick dynasty. Are things starting to crumble before us? Is the erosion happening? Give me a heart for yes, a like for not quite. The big time story as well. Could the Patriots go out and get Dez Bryant? Zachary certainly thinks so. And Dez should go to the Patriots. Zachary got New England at number one on my list for top landing spots for Dez Bryant. I think it makes a lot of sense. You look at the Patriots losing Danny Amendola to the Miami Dolphins. Brandon Cooks via a trade to the Los Angeles Rams. You're really going to trust Jordan Matthews to be a reliable receiver? And Des Bryant doesn't have to do a million things. They still have Hogan and Edelman as well. So it's like not a lot of pressure on Des, as well as the fact that Des could certainly be in contention to get a Super Bowl ring as well. So there you go. Thanks for the comment, Zach. Zachary. Be sure to hit me up in comments as well, folks. And we could feature yours here on the broadcast. All right, let's get to the next storyline here. Jarek McKinnon says the 49ers are already talking about the Super Bowl saying, quote, the Super Bowl. That's what the eyes are on. And 
This isn't the classic Super Bowl prediction in the offseason, but Jarek, I'm telling you, just tone it down a tad. Just a tad. Because, yes, the team may be unified in its expectations. That's not really the point here. The point is we've seen before players predicting a Super Bowl victory in like 99.999 repeating percent of the time the Super Bowl victory doesn't actually happen. So why? Well, who knows? There are probably a vast amount of reasons for it. Maybe number one, unneeded pressure on the team. Number two, probably doesn't really help in terms of a chemistry standpoint when you have predictions being made and your teammates are like, dude, why would you say that? Then we have to actually like seriously go out and do it or else we look like fools kind of thing. So <clears throat> there are a few reasons. And of course, for the 49ers, they're a playoff team. I think they're a top 10 team in the NFL, maybe top 12. Uh, and they went out and got some major pieces this offseason, Richard Sherman and uh, Weston Richburg as well. Whether or not they make it to the Super Bowl, I think is beside the point. I think they're in for a successful season. But uh, in terms of what McKinnon has said, admitting that you're talking Super Bowl, it usually doesn't work out in your favor. I caution 49ers fans out there as well to kind of slow your roll on this whole Super Bowl 53 thing because it wasn't a great season last year. And I know the end of the season in 2017 had a lot of momentum, particularly with Jimmy G leading the way with a 5-0 and record. And you get McKinnon, you get Richard Sherman, you get Weston Richburg. Right? You get some good players via the draft as well. McGlinchey, DJ Reed, all these guys, Tarverius Moore. I understand that. Rhinestone, a little sense of logic as well. Playoffs, maybe. Super Bowl is a stretch, though. Ryan, that's what I'm saying. Like, we're talking about a team that is going through a lot of changes. And you have to essentially assume that all of these changes will mesh, will work, will supplant you into Super Bowl contention. That's a big time reach for me. Now, playoffs, absolutely, could be in the conversation for that. Maybe in the wild card, maybe in the NFC West crown. I think the Rams actually win the NFC West. This isn't a hard prediction, but I think they are probably the favorite to land the NFC West crown. I don't have a lot of faith in Seattle. I don't have a lot of faith in Arizona. I think those two teams are rebuilding in a sense. And the NFC is very, very good, very deep. But I think the 49ers, particularly at the end of their season, could get on a run and maybe get into the playoffs. But in terms of Super Bowl, I know fans like to talk about it. I know it brings a lot of excitement. But at the same time, we should probably just caution ourselves a little bit, especially when Jarek McKinnon is a new 49er. It's like, you just got there, Jarek, and you're already like saying that the team's talking Super Bowl and all that. You're probably putting a little unneeded pressure on your fellow teammates, but that's just me. Maybe I'm completely wrong. All right, let's go to the next storyline here, and we've got Cliff Averill talking about the discord that was in Seattle, especially after Super Bowl 49, when you all remember Pete Carroll and that questionable decision at the goal line to have Russell Wilson throw the football and have that ball get intercepted by one Malcolm Butler. And Cliff Averill, of course, is no longer on the Seattle Seahawks, made several comments about Pete Carroll and the Seahawks, saying, quote, if we win that Super Bowl, I think we probably would have won another one within the two years that went by. And Averill also said, I think a lot of the guys got turned off by the message sent by Pete Carroll following Super Bowl 50 or 49 and the repercussions of that. And, you know, it's interesting. It's kind of like comparable to the New England Patriots situation. With their decision, it's kind of funny, Malcolm Butler is the center, center at both of, the, both of these stories here. New England's decision to bench Malcolm Butler in Super Bowl 52, where perhaps there's some discord within the Patriots. Same thing here with Seattle from Super Bowl 49, in that Pete Carroll decided to throw the football, not run with Marshawn Lynch, and here's what happened. There was an interception at the goal line, they lost the game. So. According to uh, this report here, Carroll reinvented himself as a more philosophically open and psychologically agile coach after the 2015 season. But if the Seahawks struggle this year, 
maybe players more and more buy less into what Pete Carroll is doing. Like I've said earlier in this show, coaching sometimes has an expiration date. And it really doesn't matter who you are in particular, unless you are the most lovable person in the history of the world. The situation can get stale. And eventually players, for whatever reason, decide to no longer buy into what you are preaching. Or, on the other side of things, the coach changes what he is preaching and the players no longer buy into what that new dynamic is. Is it the end of the Pete Carroll era here? I'm going to say not quite. I'll give up my like on that one, but let me know in the reaction poll. But boy, if we get more documentation about Pete Carroll and what he did in uh, Seattle and continues to do, certainly could be fodder for more discussion here as we go forward with future Cam Rogers shows. All right, next storyline here, we have a new signing. And Brandon Marshall is now a member of the Seattle Seahawks. He signed a one-year deal that could reach up to $2 million with incentives included. So not a big-time 2017 season with the Giants. 18 receptions, 154 yards, no touchdowns there. 2015 season was the big-time year, at least most recently with the Jets, when he went over just a shade, 1,500 yards, 109 receptions, and 14 touchdowns. But since then, his playing ability has declined in 2015 that was the big year, but then 2016, 59 receptions, 788 yards, three touchdowns, and then, of course, last year, as I talked about, injury-riddled campaign there where he didn't see a large sample size of games with New York. Marshall hasn't made the playoffs in his 12-year career, which is pretty staggering, but he is 16th in NFL history in receptions, only 23 behind Hall of Famer Randy Moss, and is just inside the top 25 in yards in touchdown receptions. Does have that bad rap of being a bit of a diva, if you will, or sometimes has the case of the drops and can, you know, make some uh, bad comments on the sidelines and all this stuff. But he's a good player. He's a nice big body receiver, somebody that the Seattle Seahawks could certainly use because Seattle lost Jimmy Graham. They don't have that big bodied receiver like a Brandon Marshall anymore. Doug Baldwin, Tyler Lockett, these are not red zone targets in a sense. So Brandon Marshall comes to town, fills a void there for Seattle. And the subplot here is obviously Des Bryant still on the market, but Brandon Marshall is not. Like, why? I want to know why. And maybe we'll get a report in regards to an answer. But there you go. Brandon Marshall, now a member of the Seattle Seahawks. How about Adrian Peterson? Has he found a team? No, he has not, but he certainly would like to join the Houston Texans. He, so he said recently that, you know, he's talked about how he's mentioned the Houston Texans a couple times. He trains in Houston, opened a mega gym there as well. Peterson also mentioned the Green Bay Packers, New Orleans Saints, maybe a reunion there. Carolina, Miami as potential fits there for the former star running back, former NFL MVP as well. Adrian Peterson seems to be understanding that he is no longer the three-down running back that he once was. Because if he joins the Panthers, he won't be the lead dog. If he joins New Orleans, he certainly won't be the lead guy. And perhaps the case with the Green Bay Packers and Miami Dolphins as well. But Miami Dolphins, that'd be interesting. The ultimate grizzled veteran running back duo of Adrian Peterson and Frank Gore. A couple of top five fantasy running backs in their careers. Interesting stuff. All right. Let's get to the next storyline here. Mark Herzlick, linebacker of the New York Giants, wants the President of the United States to speak with the team in regards to the national anthem policy. And Herzlick said it's to remain focused on the real issue here. And maybe Herzlick feel, feels that the main talking point or the main takeaway of this story is being buried because of all these different footnotes and subplots around the National Anthem. Man, Herzlick is a member of the NFLPA's executive committee, so he has some influence here. He has met with NFL officials, officials about the issue before. And as a response, by the way, head coach Pat Shermer said he wanted to wait to discuss the new policy with his players. So Mark Herzlick is reaching out to the president, wants him to come on over, talk about the National Anthem policy, and 
I applaud this because I have said many times on this show that I think there should be an open dialogue among many sides here on this issue. And if the president is willing to go ahead and engage in negotiations or discussions or an ongoing dialogue about this story here, I think it would certainly be a good thing. Certainly wouldn't be a bad thing because having deferring opinions and a marketplace of ideas here in regards to this issue all in one setting is good for the long term. So there you go. Mark Herzlick reaching out to the president. All right, let's go to the next headline here, and we've got Philip Rivers wanting his old buddy back with the Los Angeles Chargers, Mr. Antonio Gates, to be exact. And why? Well, first of all, Antonio Gates is a free agent, number one. Number two is the fact that Hunter Henry recently suffered an ACL injury, and he is likely done for the season. So with that, there is a need at the tight end position. Rivers said it would get my vote to bring Antonio Gates back to L.A., and the Chargers did sign Virgil Green to a three-year contract during the free agency period, or at least the heat of it. And he's more known as a blocker, so he's not really the receiving tight end that Antonio Gates has really proven to everybody in his Hall of Fame career so far, future Hall of Fame career there. So we'll see if Gates returns to the Chargers. Stay tuned on that. 